Hello and welcome to this very exciting episode today. Over the last months, we launched our news, lots of developments on the news side for Dean TV. That included some presenters like Gavin coming and now handing the reins to Sonako. Sonako is here to discuss who she's all about and what she's all about and tell us why she's doing the news on Dean TV. Sonako, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me, Faisal. Now, you know, people are going to get used to seeing you every night on Dean TV at 7.30 reading the news and perhaps some other programs that you were discussing with us. I remember the first time you walked into my office, I thought to myself, definitely could do the job. Without the test, I, saw, I thought this is going somewhere. Thank you. But let's go to Sonako as the person. Who is Sonako? She's crazy. <laughs> I only realized that before the show, by the way. Um, Sonako is um, a very creative, instinctive, vibrant, passionate person. And um, I really, you know, I love media, I love the arts, uh, I love radio, I love television. And uh, yeah, Sanako is just a young girl trying to grow her career, you know, and... Um... Now, going backwards, or rather back in your history, mm -hmm. where did it all start? Um, I know that you mentioned to me you were in Johannesburg, you lived most of your life in Johannesburg, and, uh, but the parents and the upbringing and the culture that you're from, mm -hmm. tell us a bit about that. Okay, well, I, am, I was born in Joburg, and uh, when I was younger, when I was really a, a baby, I went to live with my grandparents for a few years, and um, that was in the Eastern Cape. And then later on, I moved uh, back to Joburg with my parents, and you know, that's where I started school. I lived in Midrand. I went to the same school from grade one to matric. Okay. The same school. Okay, so you guys didn't kind of move around at the time, the fact that you were at the same school. Uh -huh. I mean, we moved around, but just we moved around Midrand, you know, so um, I'm pretty much a Midrand person. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, very simple, you know, upbringing, very simple life, working parents, you know. My father's an HR, my mother was a teacher, and uh, she now has her own business in the Eastern Cape that she runs. Was the upbringing sort of orthodox and was it strict? And because you mentioned to me that obviously your parents and your and the surrounding family are very educated and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So was that kind of pressure on you? A little bit. Um, you know, they, there was an expectation that I should do well in school and, you know, just do well as a person. You know, um, I was raised in a home that was very disciplined. Um, but uh, also very loving. I think my parents are very loving people. Uh, we had a lot of fun, but you know, like simple things, you know, like family jokes and family gatherings. I love those. And it's just, um, I think, very happy, you know, childhood, very good upbringing. So you matriculate and you move off to university. Yes. And you decided to study certain things. So that means before that period, you had a defining moment of what you want to do and how you want to do that. What has led up to you doing what you do today? Um, I think a lot of things have led up to this. When I was in school, I used to always be involved in drama and public speaking and debating all the cultural activities. Um, and from there, I, I knew I had a passion for drama but it wasn't something that I followed immediately after school. I actually went to study uh, BCom marketing at UJ. And so I did the marketing degree for three years and it was great and I did well because I worked hard, but I didn't really love it. And- um, It sort of was in your space. It wasn't I, I really. think everyone's got their space and it's about finding that space. Right. And you were in the process of doing that. Correct. Lots of kids go to university and they go to university because matric has finished, I need to get to university, but I don't know what I really want to do. And right. the change in the second and the third year. Right, this is that, that's exactly what happened to me. And I think I had to kind of take a step back and think about what I want to do. And marketing wasn't really it at the time. Um, so later, uh, after UJ, I went to WITS, and that's where I studied television, drama, media studies, um, what else? Film. Um, and I did radio as well. 
I did uh, Voice of Bits FM. I was a presenter and producer for two years. And I think that's where I found my voice, <laughs> ironically. Um, and I, I grew as a presenter and it kind of gave me my confidence and I started to think, well, this is what I really want to do with my life. So you found your space. I did find my space. And um, I think from there is that that's when I kind of started to develop my talent and that's when I decided to take it seriously as a career. Yeah. That's an important step and a bold one because many people get into the industry for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And they get into the industry sort of being detracted by all the things that happens around the television and film industry. If one remains focused on what you're doing and see this as a career and a business, that's when you'd be achieving certain heights. It doesn't always happen and there's a limited amount of people that sees that and follows that through. And I see that coming across mm -hmm. with your opinion in the business for a while. And I see that coming across with you and that's some, something that, that sort of attracted us to you, saying that I think that, that she can make it here. And from the wherever she goes after that, we're happy to be part of that plan and that's what we've decided to do. Mm -hmm. After university, you did a bit of theatre and that kind of thing. Tell us a bit about those experiences and how they've impacted on what you do today. I did do theatre. Um, I did uh, children's theatre. I did it, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, Were you Alice? I was the Queen of Hearts. Oh my God, even that's better. interesting. <laughs> that's even better, but isn't that some evil role? No, it's not an evil role. It is, is it? a bit of an evil role, yeah. yes. Off with their heads, that's all the Queen ever says. <laughs> but I think it was, it was a really lovely yeah. experience in the sense that it kind of it, it put me out of my comfort zone and, and I had to really go for this crazy, mad character. And, you know, I broke out of my shell and it was amazing. And then recently I also did um, another show here in Camps Bay, The Vertical Hour, and uh, it's a David Hare play. And uh, that, it's an American play. And that was interesting, you know, a lot of accent work and uh, a lot more sort of character work. And it's the Shakespeare one or? This is not the Shakespeare one. Right. Um, the, the, the Shakespeare, so this is the vertical hour that we did in Camps mm. Bay. The Shakespeare one, that was Julius Caesar that we did. It started out so as give a, us one or two lines, three? A few lines from Julius yeah. Caesar. Uh, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Okay. Uh, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Uh, and there's an interesting quote that says, um, the evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turd in their bones. Yes, of course. So, so there are some lessons to be learned from that one. There, there are some lessons to be learned. And I, and I think it, that speaks back to real life as well. I mean, you hope that the good that you do will live after you, right? I mean, that is the intention. That is, you want to build a legacy and you want to do your best that when you reach the end of your life, you can look back and people will remember you for that. But I suppose Shakespeare thinks of it differently. Of course. Yes. Now, talking about Romeo and Juliet, I know that, that my, my questions might be a bit difficult for you at this point, but anybody in life, we see you as this bubbly character. Mm -hmm. We see the positivity coming through. We, we, we pick up that you're able to do what you do and do that well and connect with audiences, whether it be on stage or whether it be on TV. But everyone's got real stories in their life. I've picked up the information that you've had some tragedies in your life. Mm -hmm. And how did that impact on you? We, you've lost someone that was very close to you, yes. your boyfriend. Yes. How did that impact on you and what lessons do you take from that going forward in what you do? Wow, that's a big question. Um, yes, uh, it is true. I did lose my boyfriend last year and it was a very sad time. It was very difficult. This was and tragically also. Yes, this was a tragic car accident. And um, I think it le I learned a lot from that, you know, I think I learned how fragile life is and how you really have to live in the moment. And when I say live in the moment, I mean live. You have to be present in your life. You have to really have intention for what you want to do with your life because you don't know how long you have. You don't know how many tomorrows are promised. And sometimes all you have is right now, you know. And for me, that was the biggest lesson. And, and also just you know, the love and compassion and support that we shared, that was a huge lesson, but also the compassion and support that came from the tragedy, from my friends, from family, from everyone. I think, um, you know, that's something that I appreciated, you know, um, that people were really supportive and 
really helped me to get through it. And another thing that I learned is, you know, you can get through difficult times. And all you have to do is do your best one day at a time. Sometimes your best is getting out of bed in the morning. And sometimes that's all you have to do. You have to show up for every moment and take it one step at a time. And you just have to trust and have faith and believe that things will get better, that you will get through it. And you'll never forget what happened. You'll never forget how you felt and, and the consequences that it left afterwards. But you'll definitely walk away a better person, a stronger person. And, and I think that there's, there's something to be learned from that and something to be shared from that. It does get better. Of course. You reminded me of something, and that is that I mentioned to you earlier on today that Oprah talks about this thing that we call mistakes mm -hmm. and change and how that influences what you actually eventually do. She says that we all have this path that we're on. So we're on a particular path, and along on that path comes mistakes and failures that we deem as failures. But they're not actually failures. What they actually are, it's just this thing that she calls it, that is leading us in the right direction. So whenever something bad happens, mm -hmm. or a failure happens that we deem failure, or a mistake, as we call it, they're not really mistakes. Mm -hmm. They're only this thing that is aligning us so that we end up going where we need to go. So every incident and issue that happens to you along that way is something that defines an action or a position of yours in the future. Mm -hmm. So you sit back in the future and you say, well, if I didn't do that, and if that didn't happen, that wouldn't have happened, and that would have happened, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have been here today. Mm -hmm. That's the story of our life. That's the story of all of our lives. I absolutely And you're on that agree. path at the moment. I absolutely agree. So, so I like the way that you see life because that's the way life should be seen. Mm -hmm. We cannot sit back saying, life is finished, I made a mistake. Exactly. And I think Oprah even goes on to say that there are no mistakes, you know. I think that's what it's titled, there is no mistake. Right. And I think that's so true because you can take an opportunity to learn from everything that happens in your life, whether it's good or bad. And, and from that, you know, I, th I heard a quote once that you only have control over what you do right now. The past is gone. The future hasn't happened. So what you do right now, that's the most important thing. It reminded you know? me about the 90-10 principle. Mm -hmm. They call it the 90-10 principle. What this actually means is 9 out of 10 times, you cannot control certain things, and 1 out of 10 times you can. For example, you cannot control the weather. Mm -hmm. You cannot control the fact that someone almost bumped into you or did bump into you this mm -hmm. morning on your way to work. You cannot control someone standing over the road hurling a comment at you. Yes. So you do not stress about those things. You, you apply no energy to things that you cannot control. Absolutely. The things that you can control, like doing better in your work or mm -hmm. de delivering better, you put all your energy into the things that you can control, and guess what? You're going to get that right because you've taken all of that energy and pumped it into this side that you do have control on. Just another mindset going forward. So now I'm going to come back to you right after the break. We go off to an ad break. When we come back, we discuss the news and where Sonoko is going with this.